Good to have you with us today here at Southern Baptist Church, as well as those that have joined us on the live stream. We're glad you're with us to worship. Uh, it's good to see a few more folks coming out. That's good. It's just always a good thing to see. Let me pray with you, and we'll get started in our time of worship today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can gather together and, and sing your praises and spend time in your word. And Father, just that your spirit meets with us in these times. We're so grateful for the Holy Spirit's presence in our midst this morning. Pray you will speak to us, draw us closer to where you want us to be. Help us to align our lives with your purposes and plans. Bless this time and use it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chelsea? Good morning, everybody. How's everybody on this wonderful spring day? Good? Ready to worship? All right, we'll stand and we're going to begin with nothing but the blood. Perfect, perfect, perfect delight. 
whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Well, good morning. This being the first Sunday of the month, this is the Sunday we usually do communion, Lord's Supper, together. And so if you hope, hopefully everyone's got one of the, I call them kits. I don't know what else to call them. Uh, it's got uh, the wafer and the juice in it as well. So if you have that, make sure you've got access to that. I want to read some scripture to you. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll observe by partaking of the elements. In Luke's gospel, chapter 22, it says, Now when the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Let's, take, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time. We pray that our hearts and minds are prepared for this observance, Father, a reminder of the great sacrifice uh, that the Son gave for us for our salvation. And we commemorate that each time and remember that each time we partake of the elements of the supper. Father, may we be, uh, our hearts be purified, our minds be focused upon what you have done for us today as we spend time with this ordinance. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you notice, you have a thin layer, of a little tab there. Make sure you pull that one back first. That'll open up the wafer. I don't know what else to call it. All right. And Jesus took the bread and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then you'll see a second tab. Pull that back carefully because the juice sometimes likes to do funny things, not good things. All right. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Remember that as often as you drink it, this do in remembrance of me. All right. Chelsea? Worship with the Revelation song. So you please stand as we worship.
Please join me for prayer. Lord God, we do praise you, Lord. We thank you for today. Just a, a beautiful day, Lord God, that you've given us. And just uh, your provision for us, we just thank you for that. And just thank you for that we're here today, that we're praising your name, Lord God, and that we're uh, just um, being in your presence, Lord. I just pray that as a pastor brings the message, that our hearts will be open, that we will take in what uh, you have for us, Lord God, and that we would... Um, use it as we go into our lives and into our everything that we're doing this week. Just be with us, guide us, and lead us in that. And just, again, be with us as we go uh, through the rest of this, um, the, the rest of the uh, today. Thank you, Lord, and I praise you and thank all, and ask all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Well, good morning, folks. Hope everyone's doing well today. Enjoy, get ready to enjoy the day later. But today we're going to look, uh, we're actually in the Sermon of the Mounts where we're in, but it's uh, Jesus' teaching on prayer in Matthew 6 is where we'll be this morning, Matthew 6, 5 through 15. It's interesting, in Luke's gospel, this, all, this whole conversation stems from a question 
uh, the disciples, uh, request the disciples make of Jesus. But we're going to be in Matthew's gospel. Well, really, Jesus is just, as a part of his teaching, uh, Matthew 5 through 7 is uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and he's kind of teaching folks a lot of things. And he's just been talking prior to this about religious hypocrisy. I'm glad it's something we don't struggle with in our land today, right? Uh, but uh, anyway, that's kind of the, 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 so you kind of get the frame of this. And in this, the disciples and every, these, these are people that are listening to him are trying to figure out what he's saying, but he's really trying to help them understand what it means to pray. And I believe that prayer is probably the forgotten discipline and the least focused discipline uh, in the church of Jesus Christ, especially in the West. Uh, I mean, we, we know, I'm not saying we don't know how to pray, we don't pray, but we don't really think of prayer as being as significant as it is. I think prayer is the one thing that the Father uh, encourages us to do, that Jesus teaches us to do, that enables us to accomplish the mission that God has sent us to do, but also helps us experience a relationship with Him like nothing else. Prayer is a time of literal communion and communication with our Creator, and that the Creator of the universe would desire to commune and talk to us should still, it always does overwhelm me. If we were to try and get a hold of the President of the United States on the telephone, it would be a challenging circumstance, wouldn't it? I mean, it's just hard to do. You know, I don't think you could arrange a meeting with someone or any dignitary for that matter. It's very challenging. Or, or maybe you have a celebrity you'd like to meet. It would be, you'd have to go through 14 layers of bodyguards to get to him. But the king of the universe, the creator of all that is, you can speak to him any day, any time, all you have to do is call upon his name. He has that, given us that kind of access through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus talks about prayer, and he wants to model for them prayer because the disciples had seen a lot of prayer, might have experienced and done some prayer in their walk with God and learning these things, but he wants to give them kind of a new, a new way of looking at prayer, a new understanding of prayer and what it means. And my hope and, and obvious prayer through this is that God speaks to us in a way this morning that enables us to understand a deeper, more abiding way of what it means to pray. So if you have your copy of God's Word of Matthew 6, verses 5 to 15, if you're able, would you stand with me in read, honor of reading God's Word this morning? Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15. I often wonder if they stand at home when they're... I doubt it, anyway. Just, let's go. All right. When you pray, Jesus says, you are not to be like the hypocrites... For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. For the Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the time that we're able to spend in your word this morning. I pray you use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to each of us, your people today, that we might hear, we might understand, we might allow the Holy Spirit to move our hearts towards alignment with what you desire in our lives. Use this time in whatever way you desire. May you be exalted through it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You know, as I think of, think of prayer, a lot of the things I remember about being a student youth minister for many years is one of the things we would often do was gather in a circle and pray and, and trying to teach students to pray. Because at first when you would do that with a group of teenagers, you would be the only one praying. Nobody wanted to pray because they didn't know what to, how to pray. I mean, how do you talk to God? I mean, don't you have to use certain words? Don't you have to, you know... And that's kind of the understanding early on. I remember going to my home church, you know, thinking they would have prayers. And the only prayers I knew, I mean, my dad prayed at home and stuff and prayed around the meal t- time. And, but I remember the prayers in church, and they were always very flowery, very ornate. It seemed like most of them in my home church were done in the King James English, and I didn't speak that way. So anyway, as we would experience it, I wondered, is this really what prayer is about? But I, as time went on in my walk with God, as I began to learn some things about that and and really, in my experience as a teenager, my youth minister walked us through some things in teaching us to pray. 
I began to learn a little bit more about what that was. And I hope that in this brief time we have this morning, we can kind of maybe get rid of some of the hang-ups that some of us have about prayer. Because a lot of times I think the reason why we don't pray as much as we should, and I think if most of us were honest, we know we could pray more. That's just pretty much the reality of it as followers of Christ. We know that. But we, we get hung up in things that are kind of unnecessary expectations, thinking that God expects a certain conversation with him. And yet God wants us to talk to him. And he wants to talk to us. He talks to us through his word. Sometimes he will speak to us through a still, small voice that, that audibly does speak to us. And the Holy Spirit ministers in that way. And he wants us to have that deep, abiding relationship and communion with him in prayer. Prayer is, is a, a mystery in some ways, but yet such a powerful means of communication that is so often ignored in our walk. And I think mostly because we don't know much about it and because it's hard. I believe you will find prayer to be extremely difficult to carry out because prayer is one thing that Satan fears more than anything else we can do as followers of Christ. He does not fear my sermons. He does not fear our acts of mercy and the kindness that we do with our hands. He does not fear our reading the Bible. What he does fear more than anything is that we get on our knees before the Father and we petition him. Because in that time as we pray, we are able to access the throne room of heaven. We are able to commune with God. God is able to do things in our lives and able to transform us and change us from who we often are before Christ to who he's wanting us to become. And with that all in mind, I think that's why this prayer and prayer in general is so significant in our life. And the, the way that Jesus teaches the disciples, I, I, as we all know, Jesus is the master teacher, obviously. There's no question about that. But it's just really... I love the way he draws them in as he's talking to all these people. There's a large crowd gathered together as he shares this. And he tells them about prayer and how it's important not to pray like the hypocrites, not like those who simply pray. Now, I'm sure you've never experienced this probably, hopefully not in church too much, but maybe sometimes in life where people just pray, and when they're praying, they're not really praying to God, they're praying to be heard, right? We'll just leave that alone. That does happen. And I can remember many years ago, uh, when I was trying to lead students in the process of prayer and how to learn, I had, it seemed like in every youth group, I always had one that was trying to impress everybody with his prayer life. And it was in our, we would gather in a circle, and it was kind of the way we would kind of close out our meetings oftentimes, and we would just pray. And, you know, what very many of us, we'd kind of go through it. And, and everybody kind of knew who was going to pray. It's kind of way, you know, it's kind of a pecking order that happens because not everybody wanted to speak, and that's okay. But I was just trying to get students comfortable with the idea of praying publicly and out loud. And so there would always be one in every group that felt like it was his need to lead us in a prayer that might last 15 to 20 minutes. Now, do you know what it's like to listen to a prayer for that long? And imagine being 14, 15 years old and listening to a prayer for that long. Okay? And you've already been through, you know, the time, the mess. You're getting the what, and the night is kind of winding down. You're kind of moving to that, and you know what's between you and this is some free time in the gym or wherever, and you're going to get to do just kind of hang out. And somebody decides to go into a sermon prayer is what I call them. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it, it's really just a lot of words. And I, I share that because that's not the kind of prayer that God is looking for. And that's not the prayer that Jesus describes here. Now, this prayer we look at in a few moments, we call it the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, kind of gives us a format of how to pray. It's not so much the words themselves. They're not magical. They're not in a, in a certain way, but it really is the, the way that it kind of gives us a, a template for how we should, our prayer should be constructed. And we'll get into that here just a little bit later in the message. But the reality is, is really, I think, prayer, that's why verse 6 is so significant, what Jesus and how Jesus wants us to commune with him, it says after he talked about the Pharisees, he says, when you pray, I want you to go into your room, your inner room, wherever that is. Now, that may, people call that your closet, your prayer closet. Wherever that is, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you, reward you. Prayer is intimate communion with God. It is sacred space. And Jesus understood this more than anyone and no one prayed like Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed more than anyone, which in a lot of ways to me seems kind of strange because he's God, he's the Son of God, and yet he spends so much time in prayer with the Father, sometimes all night long. 
And for those of us who obviously need prayer more than Jesus, I think I need to pray more. I think I need that. It's such a struggle sometimes to pray for even a few minutes. And my point this morning is not to make you get, feel guilty about the amount of time you pray, but to understand that God wants to commune with you and God can transform your prayer life as you spend time with him. And even in the scriptures, the scriptures give us some great illustrations and reminders. But anyway, let's get into where, because prayer is really that, it, it's not just words. And a lot of times we make it about words. And we're really good about that. We make everything about words. That you got to say it a certain way. Prayer is just communication. It's just talking to God. Like you talk to one another. Like you talk to your friends. You talk to your children. You talk to your spouse. That's what prayer is. It's just simply communicating with God. There's not a code language. There's not a specific language you have to use. And sometimes prayer is not words. And for me personally, some of the most deep and meaningful times of prayer for me, no words are ever uttered on my part. It's silence. Silent before God because words, words sometimes cheapen things, don't they? Sometimes when you use words, they don't communicate really what you want to communicate. And that's often true in prayer. It says in the Scripture in another place that sometimes the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit prays for us with, with groanings too deep for words, as the Holy Spirit petitions on our behalf before the Father. Prayer is often like that. Prayer are those seasons where you may spend time before God and you just don't know what to say. You may be going through an issue in your life and something you want guidance from God, you want a word from God, you want to hear from Him, you want the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and you really don't know how to capsule it, just tell him as best you can and then listen. I think one of the great things I've learned over time in my prayer life is one of those times is the, is the times of just still before the Lord. As it says in Psalm 46, those times of stillness, those times of silence are incredible times of communion and fellowship and, and hearing from God. And as Jesus teaches the disciples to pray here, pray here, he's reminding them of the importance of this relationship. It's not about what you say. It's not about what you, it's the, it's the relationship and how you commune with him. Let's go on here in the prayer. And the prayer is, is basic, and there's some basic parts to it that kind of, I think, allude to us. Why well, I think it's great to call this really a model prayer. It's not so much, we call it the Lord's Prayer. To me, that's really more John 17, where, where Jesus is petitioning the Father before He's about to go to the cross. That's really more, when I think of the, when I think of the Lord's Prayer, that's what I think of. Because he's praying for us. He's praying for the church. He's praying for all of us. He's praying for strength as he's going through some, about to face something incredibly difficult. But in this prayer, he just kind of reminds us daily. He says, pray then in this way. Our Father who's in heaven. You start off with praise and adoration here. You identify who you're, you're praying to God. You say, our Father. And, and this is a bad translation our Father's a bad translation, okay? It's a bad translation not only of the Greek, but of the Aramaic, of, what, of the prayer of what it actually says in the, in the language. Because what Jesus is saying here is address Father Abba in the, in, the, in the Aramaic. Now, you've heard Abba, Abba. And what that is is that very guttural, childlike expression of our Father. Now, I know there is a great debate among parents as to what children will say first, mama or dada, right? And I hate to break it to you, I think we mostly know the truth that it is dada. And it's not because we're special guys, it's because it's just easier to say, okay? And in the Hebrew, in this culture, abba was very easy to say. I mean, it's one of the first things a child could utter. And it's very intimate when you think about that relationship between a, a child and a parent. And that's what I think God wants us to understand about our prayers. It's very intimate. It's very close. God is drawing us to himself, and he wants us to fellowship and to meet with him and not to think of him as the man upstairs, not to think of him as our father, but to think of him as dad. Dad, dad. 
Abba, Papa, whatever expression comes. He is our Father. And that's in this prayer. And this is revolutionary. You understand how it's hard for us to grasp how revolutionary this idea of prayer was as Jesus expressed to the disciples. This was so against everything they had seen and experienced in their, in their lives. And he's saying, I want you to address him. He is your, your Abba, your Papa, your, your Dada in heaven. And he loves you. Address him in this way. And then show that great praise, hallowed or holy be your name. You are, you are exalted. You are above all other gods. You alone are God, and you understand that that title and, and praising God. I want to challenge you to encourage you, not challenge, encourage you to do something maybe. Take some time to do this sometime in your life. And you can maybe as a group, as a family, or maybe just yourself individually. Have a praise fest with God. Simply spend time in prayer. It may be three minutes, maybe ten minutes, maybe a half an hour. It doesn't matter to me. It's between you and God. And just spend time praising God for who he is. And thanking Him for what? Don't ask for anything. No petitions, just praising Him. I used to do that with our students. It was kind of interesting. They, we would teach them the names of God and some of the understandings of God's character. Then we would have what we'd call a praise fest. And it was interesting how that developed and, and how, how over time, we, the more we did it, the more they kind of got used to and understanding that. Because there's just something about that's part of prayer. That's a key part of prayer is adoration and praise. And it begins the prayer that way. Start off that way, he says. And this idea of thanksgiving, this idea of understanding his role in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A declaration, we know you are the king of all. And I know in this season of life that we found ourselves in, there are some in our world that want to tell us the world is out of control and nobody knows what's going on, but God knows what's going on. Never let that escape your mind or your notice. God is still in control. He has not stepped off his throne. He never will. He is the Lord God of heaven. He is the king. As it says in this prayer, as it defines it quite clearly, your kingdom come. Your will be done. I love this. On earth as it is in heaven. God's will is always done right in heaven, and it will be done on earth. And it will be accomplished in time the way he desires. And that's what this prayer says. Lord, let your will be done, literally saying, in us as it is in heaven. Let us be as faithful to you as the angels in heaven. Let us see your will come to pass. That's really where Jesus is taking them with this prayer. And then he moves into the first act of supplication or asking for something there in verse 11. Give us this day enough bread for the rest of our lives. Right? Is that what it says? Nope. Our daily bread. Now, it's really hard for us to relate to that in the 21st century here in America because usually when you go to the grocery store, you probably don't go every day unless you have to. You try to get enough stuff for the week, right? That's what we do. That's why we have refrigerators, right? It's good. It's a good thing. We get enough stuff. We get things, you know, so we can go. Now, there are parts of the world that do not have that convenience, and so they go to the market every day to get what they need for the day. And they have a little better understanding of daily bread. If you go back in the book of Exodus, you remember at Exodus, you remember the children of Israel were out in the wilderness and God provided food for them from heaven called manna. And he gave them enough manna for the day. You remember that? And they were to go out every morning and they would collect and get the manna and bring it back. And they were to bring back enough for the day. And they were never to save it and try and get extra and save it for the next day because what happened to it if they saved it? Got nasty. Yeah got worms and whatever else in it, and it was, it was of no use. Except on Friday. I was thinking, this is, God's, I love the way God does stuff and that he can do what only he can do. On Friday, they said, you got permission on Friday to gather enough for two days because Saturday was the Sabbath, the seventh day was the Sabbath. They were to rest on that day. So you need to gather enough for the two days. And on that one day when you gather, it will not spoil. Now that had to be tough because you, you know there's, some, but there's always somebody, right? that's going to try and take advantage. There's always somebody, no matter in a group of this, we're talking about a million people here, by the way. There's always somebody that's going to try and skirt the rules a little bit. And so you know there was somebody that gathered a little extra and thought, we'll have enough for tomorrow, so maybe I can sleep in and won't have to go out in the morning. Right? And then they opened that up and, whoa, I bet that thing stunk. And so when they said, well, if you do that on Friday, it's going to be okay. They're like, oh, I don't know about this. I've done this before. So if I guess if you want to eat, you go and gather. Anyway, that's enough of the, the manna. 
But that idea of daily bread that he's talking about here, that we trust God for our daily sustenance, each and every day knowing that God will provide for us is what he's expressing here in this prayer. And God does provide for us every day. It's like we breathe. We breathe more than once a day, right? I hope so. You're not going to get very far if you do. But we, we take each breath as it comes. We can't breathe up enough and store it for later. Now, we try to when we go underwater. You know, when you were a kid and you go underwater, you know, to, to hold your breath or if you have a contest. And then you breathe, and then, you know, if you don't pass out. And you hold your breath. And if you can do it for very long, over 30 seconds, I'm impressed. I can't. But you need, your body needs that, and so your spirit also needs that daily bread as well. You need that daily nourishment. And it's not just food he's talking about. It really, I think, it implies our relationship. Daily we come to him. Daily we come to him. Not just, oh, I came to him on Sunday and I'm good for the rest of the week. But every day we're with him. Let's go on here. And now he gets into the nitty-gritty. These are the nice things we like to talk about. And then he says, and forgive us our debts. In other words, what it says in my translation. Forgive us our sin, what we've done. Forgive us as we also have forgiven those who have sinned against us. There's the hard part. You understand that? We are to forgive as we are forgiven. I'm going to let that sink in again. We are to forgive as we are forgiven. As we are forgiven by God, we are to forgive others as well. We are to show them the same kind of mercy. Now, I know heart forgetting is hard, but that's what he says. You forgive. In fact, there's even if you go on down, I'm going to, while we're here, I want to go on down to verse 14 and 15, because he kind of really expounds on that at the end of the text. He says, for if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. I don't like that. I don't know how you are. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't like what that says, but it's true, isn't it? Because I don't like it, does it make it less true? Because it makes me uncomfortable because of the truth that it proclaims does not make it what it is not. It is truth. We are to forgive others as we are forgiven. That principle is laid out twice in this text. Jesus reminds him. I always found it interesting in this part of the prayer, the way he, of course, I know he's teaching before a large multitude, but he reminds them of that significant point that we forgive as we are forgiven. And really, I think the next part of the verse. 13 really capsulizes why we should understand the importance of this when it says, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. You are the boss. You are in charge. You are in control. You will receive all glory and honor forever because you are God. And Jesus wanted the disciples to understand once again who they were talking to. And to conclude their prayer with a, a sense of a praise again and adoration of God's great power, God's great role, God's primacy, God's supremacy, all of that is laid out in this prayer. There's so much here, and I mean, I've just, we just kind of walked through it just a minute, but really for me, prayer is always about dependence, isn't it? And I think part of the reason why Jesus wanted to instruct the disciples to pray and how to do it was so that they understand that it is some part of our walk with God that we need that daily time with him. We look back in the book of Genesis after the creation that it often said in the cool of the day that God would come to walk in the garden and spend some time with Adam and Eve, right? God just enjoys time with his children, with, his peop- with, with, with us. He loves us. He wants to commune with us. He wants to be with us. He's not you know, sitting up there just thinking, all right, I'm just going to see which one I'm going to zap today or whatever. No, that's not what he does. He wants to be in our midst. That's why with the children of Israel, and they struggled with this, when they, when they went out of Egypt and they were headed to the promised land, they literally carried the tabernacle with them everywhere they went. It was in their midst and they would set, it was a tent and they would set it up wherever they camped out. And that's where they went to meet with God. But the idea of that, I think, is powerful because, it, once again, God is with them on their journey. God is going with them. He is always there. They understood that. And then when they move into Israel and they get their own place and their own country, then they build the temple finally. They, they beg God. David did, and they finally built, God lets them build a temple. And they got in their minds that if I want to go talk to God now, I have to go to Jerusalem and go to the temple. And they lost that beautiful picture of God with us, of Emmanuel, God walking with us, God being with us. Anytime God says, come to me. 
And I think at times, if we're not careful in the church of Jesus Christ today, we struggle with that as well. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or facetious, but this is not God's house. God does not live here at South End Baptist Church in this building. Did you know that? God is present when you are here. When we are here, God is present. But this is not, you know, he doesn't have a room in the back, you know, with a cot. Okay? But there are people who think of this as, of a church as God's house. And, and that's, I understand the sacredness and it's a place we meet. I understand that. But God can't be contained in this building. He's far bigger than what we have here. There's no way we can contain him. We can't hold him in. And you don't have, and, and, and I'm not trying to dissuade you from being to church. You know what I'm saying? But you don't have to only be here to meet with him. Does that make sense? You meet with him everywhere, everywhere, because he's everywhere. And as his child, he walks with you. In fact, he now indwells you, the scripture teaches, as a follower of Christ. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And you are, God is with you everywhere you go. And that's at the heart, I think, of what, Jesus is trying to help the disciples understand this incredible truth. That's what prayer is. It's that communion, that walking with God, that experiencing God's presence on a daily basis. Because there will be times in your life, there will be some days that are different than other days. There will be some days that you're really going to wonder and you're going to struggle. And you might even be a little anxious or scared. And you're wondering, God, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? I don't know how this is going to work. And God knows those days are coming, and God is wanting to walk with you in the middle of those days. And the practice of daily being with him will help you and prepare you so that when that day comes, you know, okay, God, here I am. I know you're here. Walk with me. Help me to walk through this difficult time in my life. We've all had those days, and we will have those days. That's part of being human. I remember years ago I had an experience. You know, it's funny. I learned the most from God when I'm the most uncomfortable. Does that work for anybody else that way? When God kind of knocks my feet out from me a little bit and kind of puts me in an environment that doesn't quite fit my normal routine, that tends to be when I listen most attentively to God and actually learn more than when I'm just going through the emotions of life. And I remember years ago, my first overseas mission trip, I had, I had been out of the country but never across the ocean anywhere else like that. I went to Eastern Europe with a group of folks, and I was, it was for two weeks, and I was really nervous because I was told you got to take enough for two weeks, and there, there aren't any uh, stores there to pick stuff up. Like, if you forget your toothbrush, good luck. You got to make sure you have, and so they had the list, and so my, Debbie and I were going through everything, getting the list, getting everything you'd rather for me to go, and I was, I knew, because every trip I always forget something. It just seems that's just, I, nobody else is like that, right? Always forget something, but I, for amazingly on that trip, I didn't forget anything. Got everything I needed to take with me. But it was just the preparation, the stress of that. And I can remember being over there and being in a, a, a place that I, they didn't speak our language. Very few people did. And the food. Yeah. You know, I have a list of foods in my life that I will only eat when forced to. You have those? Right? You know, Brussels sprouts when you were a kid, whatever. You know, spinach. And beets. And I know some of you love beets. Love you. It's great. I cannot stand beets. Just going to tell you. Not a fan. What do you think one of the primary food sources are in Belarus? They love their beets. Oh, my goodness. They love beets. Every meal, beets. And they even have a soup called borscht. It's beet soup. Like tomato soup. But with beets. Yeah. Not a fan, ate it every meal, except breakfast. They forced them, thank you. But every lunch, they thought we needed to have soup with our meals, so we had borscht. I learned if you put a lot of sour cream in it, it's okay. Kind of, you know, like putting milk in, if those that don't like tomato soup, put a lot of cream in it, but it kind of helps it. But I endured it. it for two weeks, I ate a lot of beets and borscht and, and some sausage that I can't even describe. It was great. The hospitality of these people was amazing because they went way overboard for us. But the, it was, I was uncomfortable. Does that make sense? They also had a weird thing they did there in that part of Belarus where we were at in the town. It was actually the town of Magalov. You can find it on a map. It's a huge city, but it was very close to Chernobyl, uh, where Chernobyl had happened in the Ukraine. The Ukraine kind of borders up against Belarus. 
And so, but because of shortages of power, you would have hot water either two or three days a week. And the rest of the week, no. And so because of that and knowing us and our culture and that we kind of like to bathe more than once or twice a week, my host, was she was amazingly gracious. She would literally boil water on the stove in the bathtub to warm up the water so I wasn't taking a cold bath in the morning. Very, very, just amazing woman. I mean, she's just so kind to us. But simple things like that, I think those were the kind of things I remember going through and it kind of took me off my game because my routine was messed up. But then God taught me so much in that period and taught me a lot about dependence and trust and provision. And I think we all need that at times in our lives. We need to be reminded that God daily wants to provide for us. Because in our culture, it's a little different the way we operate. And we sometimes lose sight of that. But in many parts of the world, that's still the way it runs and what operates. That daily they go and get their food for the day. Daily they get whatever they need. And Jesus, when he says this, speaks so powerfully to us. This daily relationship. And in our walk with him, we daily need to commune with him. We daily need to experience his presence every day. You can't wait for me to give you a sermon on Sunday in Chelsea to lead you in some great worship to get your spirit going and think that's going to be enough to week. Because like we always say, you, you eat more than once a week, right? I hope so. I'm looking at you. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to guess you eat more than once a week, Okay. <laughs> I can look in the mirror, and I know I eat more than once a day. I know that. So, I mean, gotcha. Why do we not need spiritual nourishment more than once a week? And Jesus was, this is a simple thing. Daily prayer, daily time with God. If you haven't got that as a part of your life and a routine part of that, will transform your faith and transform the way you see God. And Jesus is giving us a great idea, a great way to do that, a great way to understand prayer. Because prayer, basically, to kind of put it down for you in an easy way for you to understand, I, don't, I like easy. That, you might have noticed that as you've known me here for a while as I've been here. I like easy. I like to understand things, and I like those kind of things that help me get it. And I think one of the great things as we look at this prayer, Jesus is kind of laying out what I call, uh, not me, others have called it the ACTS model prayer, A-C-T-S. And I like acronyms because I can remember them. That's one way I like them. And they stand for different things. And in prayer, ACT stands for this. A is adoration. C is confession, confessing my sins. T is what? What do you think? Thanksgiving. There you go. And S, the last thing, is supplication, asking for things. That's really the basic parts of this prayer and any prayer for that matter. But I love how it starts off with adoration, with Praising God for who He is. Thanking God for what He's done later, comes later, but praising Him. Praising Jehovah, praising the Redeemer, praising our Deliverer, praising the Great and Mighty One, the Almighty, the One and Only. Like Him there is no other. Praising Him. And as we begin to allow this to become a daily practice of our lives, I believe, I, not because I'm smart, but because I've experienced it, you will see a change in your relationship with God. Prayer is not just something we do at bedtime, nighttime, and mealtime. We can do it at any time of the day. And I encourage you to do it at those times. I'm not saying don't do that. But I think praying and that communication with God is really at the very core of who we are as followers of Christ and really needs to be at the core of who we are as a church. Now, we have a, a weekly prayer meeting that we have on Wednesdays. We do it now via you know, our, our Facebook page. And, and we also, the deacons also lead us in a prayer time on Friday nights. Hope you've been able to catch that. It's usually about seven o'clock. They kind of lead us in a brief prayer time. But prayer needs to be more than just that. That should be kind of just a, a shot in the arm at those times, just a reminder. Because prayer is your time with God. Much as Jesus said in the first part of this text, you go into your room, wherever that is, your place where it's just you and God, and you talk to him. And you know what's amazing? He listens. Yeah, he listens. And he responds. Now, does he always respond like you want him to? No. I'm not going to lie to you. That's, that's... Can you manipulate him? No. But he hears you. 
And also, don't be caught up in the language and also the emotions, because that's the other side of it. Because you know, you realize when you're anybody, now don't raise your hand because you might, you're going to get struck, but I've been mad at God before. If you haven't been mad at God yet, it's coming. That's part of it. King David was mad at God more than once, okay? He, he, and he talked about it and wrote Psalms about it. Paul was mad at God. A lot of the great, everybody, everybody, Moses had times he was, I don't know if he would say mad, but he was very frustrated with God. Is that fair to say? Very upset. God knows when I'm mad at him anyway, so why not just be honest with him about it? And it's that kind of community. And I'm, I'm saying that not to just, but the emotions are a part of our lives, aren't they? God made us as emotional creatures. We experience all these different range of emotions in our lives, and they are not absent from the prayer room. They shouldn't be. And our communication with God. So I guess if I'm, I don't know really what I'm, how to capsulize what I'm trying to say here in prayer, but just be honest and transparent in your prayer life. I mean, God knows it anyway. You can't, can you hide anything about yourself from God? Well, I'm going to pretend I'm okay with God, that everything's cool and we're just, you know, and I'm really respectful. You can do that, but God knows your heart. He knows you. He knows your brothers and sisters. He knows all of us. He knows me. He knows what I am. He knows me when no one else is around, but just him and I. He knows when I get flustered. He knows when I get, knows when I'm happy. He knows all of those things about me. So just be who you are. And let prayer become more that communion and realize that, as I said, it's not all about words. It's all about communication with our Creator. And oftentimes, the way you communicate with someone is just by being with them, isn't it? I'm about done, I know. I know you're probably watching your watch and thinking it's getting close to time. But we're, we're good. Let me look at my watch. Oh, we're great. I got another 20 minutes. I'm not going to do that. I'm really about done. But this is really one of the things I've learned in this chaplaincy journey, which is really wild because I found out that I'm going to have my paper due on the 25th of this month. Yeah. So it's coming to it, which is good, but it's also scary. So pray for me uh, as I do that. But I've learned a lot in, in being with people that a lot of times they don't have to say anything. When you're with a woman who's been given the news that none of us want to be given, that her days are numbered, words really don't mean much. But just being in the room together, means a lot. And I remember when my father was ill towards the end of his life, the last basically week of his life, and we were in the hospital. Uh, and it was rough. And you, many of you have been through these kind of experiences. You know what that's like. It's rough. I mean, there's nothing that prepares you for it. It's just hard, emotionally draining. But I was so thankful. We had a, a chaplain, a local chaplain at the hospital, and it was a she, and she would come up, and she would just sit in the room with my mom. She didn't say much. She'd just sit in there with us for a while. But it was so comforting. I remember that. I'll never forget that. Just her presence, just having someone in there that was trying to, not, not knowing everything we were experiencing. She couldn't understand that because was, it wasn't her dad. But just knowing that spoke to my spirit. And when families in our fellowship go through difficulty, understand the power of presence. Your presence has. Because I hear people say, well, I wouldn't know what to say. I wouldn't, no, don't worry about it. Just being there makes a huge difference in people's lives. And many of you have experienced that as well in your times of difficulty. And remember that for one another. We need one another. There's just something about having another human in the room, isn't there? And I think as a body of believers, sometimes, we need to remind ourselves of that and, and be willing to do that, to be that for someone else when they're going through those difficult times. It's about sharing those, those tears, sharing the joys, but also sharing the struggles. And our God is with us, and that is wonderful. He is always with us, but sometimes we just need flesh and blood around us too, don't we? Anyway, that's a sidebar. That was a bonus on the sermon, all right? But in all this, my, my hope for each of us is that our prayer life begins to become something more than just something we do to get it done. 
that it becomes a part of the relationship that we have with our Creator as He speaks to us every day. The eternal King of the universe, the Creator of all that is, the one and only, the Almighty, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Exalted One, wants to hang out with you. Wow. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Every day and every time I meet with you, I am overwhelmed always. It's just part of the way it is. I can't fully articulate it, and you know it. But I'm so grateful, God, that you are so willing to simply be with us. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters today. If there's one here today that has not begun their relationship with you, I pray that today would be that day, whether they're with us here or whether they're watching. Or Father, maybe there's some folks going through some things, and I just pray, Father, that uh, we as their brothers and sisters would encourage them and lift them up. And I know that you are already at work comforting them. We know we have a family in our church that is struggling with loss today, and we just pray your blessings upon them. Father, use this time in whatever way you want to use it. It's all yours. Be glorified in all that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.